Welcome everyone to our Q&A session with Professor Jeffrey Siegel. He is an air quality and building design expert from University of Toronto. Welcome Professor to our Q&A today. Thanks, glad to be here. Absolutely, my name is Dilshad Berman. I am a writer and reporter with City and 680 News and I will be moderating this chat today. Now, today we're talking about air quality and building safety because kids are heading back to school in September and there have been a lot of concerns regarding the air quality in schools and how safe they are and how the buildings are designed um, to be safe in a COVID-19 world. Um, so the way this works is we have been collecting your questions over the past week for the professor. He's never heard them before. It's all off the cuff and he's gonna provide his expertise and answer them. If you haven't had a chance to submit your questions, you can still do so in the comments under this live broadcast. And we're gonna try and, try and take as many questions as we can in this short half hour period that we have with the professor. So professor, are you ready to go? We're gonna start with a cache of questions that I have for you. Ready to go, let's do all it. Right. So let's start with uh, one of the basics, and this is more of a comment than a question, but it'll give us a great jumping off point. Farhad asks, now all of a sudden air quality is an issue. We survived in those schools back in the day, no issue. So why is air quality and ventilation so important to talk about right now when it comes to COVID-19 in schools? Okay, so ventilation has always been <clears throat> really important to talk about. And one of the big reasons why um, we haven't talked about it is because a lot of the health effects we see from ventilation are things that happen a long time after exposure, right? And so we get exposed to all kinds of things in buildings and that increases our risk of cardiovascular disease, of lung cancer, of a whole variety of, of things, but it happens much later in time. And so with COVID-19, obviously there's not that delay. So that's why we care about it now, but I would argue that we always should have cared about it. Right, absolutely. Um, okay, and then uh, next up, we have a question from Abu. Abu asks, does Ontario consider ASHRAE 62 standards enforceable in schools? Are there any enforceable standards for indoor air quality, including ventilation and filtration in schools? Fantastic question. And uh, the, the short answer is the way most ventilation codes are applied are at the time of construction. So if a school was built in 1940, the ventilation code that it's built to was whatever code was in place in 1940. Right. And uh, so, so the reality is our buildings don't keep up with standards. The second part of the question was about indoor air quality regulations. And unfortunately, we have no indoor air quality regulations, and that's true almost everywhere in the world. Right. And the challenge is, is that you know, our indoor environments are generally speaking private indoor environments. And so it's really hard. It's not like outdoor air quality where um, we, the government can make a regulation and people have to meet that regulation. You can't tell people, you know, you can't cook, you can't smoke, you can't do all the things that generate air pollution uh, in your building. And then the other comment ties back to how I answered a second ago about the long range impacts of indoor air pollution. That's the other problem is that, you know, this is not a problem where we see people getting sick right away. Mm -hmm. uh, from the exposures that happen indoors. So that also makes it very difficult to regulate. Right, okay. Um, and then uh, let's move on. Okay, this question is about, I guess, what we can do this fall. What did we do right in schools last year and what do we need to fix for this coming fall? Well, the first part of that's easy to answer. I don't think we did nearly as much as we could have uh, last fall. And um, I really hope we do a better job this fall. And what we need to do is, um, the first thing we need to do is understand that there's not kind of safe, unsafe. It's not a binary thing. We have to take lots of different measures. Um, they're all gonna be imperfect, but the idea is you get enough of them and you get enough of a protective layer. So for example, uh, we need to evaluate every school and make sure that we're ventilating as much as possible without compromising other things like comfort or noise or other issues. And then especially in schools where we can't ventilate at all or can't ventilate very much, we have to increase filtration in the central systems. And that's not always possible too. I mean, some schools don't even have central forced air system. They have radiators. Uh, and other schools don't have fans that are powerful enough to put in uh, good filters. So in those cases, we have to also look at portable filtration uh, in school spaces. 
And the other thing is I'm talking a lot about ventilation and filtration because that's what I know. But, you know, remember that, that a lot of those layers have nothing to do with ventilation and filtration. You know, vaccination is a great and really effective layer. Masks are a great and really effective layer. Uh, physical distancing, watching out for crowded areas. Uh, and then one other piece that I hope we do a lot more of, not just in schools, but in all of our buildings and saying, what are the high risk areas? And let's target resources at those areas. So imagine you've got a cafeteria or a break room where people can't wear masks because they're eating. That's a high risk area. You've got to address it. Let's say you've got an intensive support classroom where you have you know, uh, the staff working very close proximity uh, to their students. And so you can't do physical distancing. Masks can be tough in some, some student populations. So you've got to treat that as a high risk environment and treated appropriately. So when it comes to a high risk environment, though, in terms of air quality and things like that, what are the additional supports or additional measures that can be taken in those spaces? Like you said, like a cafeteria or a classroom where, you know, students and teachers have to be at close proximity. Yeah, so I think that you the first thing you do is it's more of ventilation and filtration. So making sure they're there and, you know, we can do other things, too you know, there's always a question of resources and maintenance and all those things, but we have tools at our disposal, things like upper room ultraviolet systems, uh, which can be very effective in reducing the, the risk of COVID and a lot of other respiratory and, and, and other microbiological uh, issues indoors. So, you know, we have some other things we can do if it's really high risk. Although the biggest thing I think is, you know, let's do the ventilation, filtration, and portable filtration, and do them well. I mean, that's the other piece that sometimes gets lost. You can't just, you know, buy a good filter and expect magic. You've got to make sure it's installed well. You've got to make sure there's enough air going through it. You've got to make sure that it's changed appropriately. Uh, so we kind of have to, all of us, not just schools, but all of us have to be much more engaged in, in our buildings and how they operate. Right. And stay on top of things. Like you said, I mean, even filters need changing, even something like a humidifier, you have to clean it and, and, you know, change the filter often enough. So for sure, something. To Absolutely. Right. Um, okay, let's move on to our next question. Um, okay, when it comes to testing air quality, do we know how many particles of COVID-19 have to be in the air for it to be infectious? Yes, so uh, we don't know. But even if we did know, that's actually a really hard thing to measure, really, really hard, because not only uh, does it matter, you know, whether there's COVID in the air, but it matters whether it's able to convey infection, and then it matters what size particle it's in, too. A big particle is going to behave differently from a small particle and end up in a different place in our respiratory system. Mm -hmm. Not to mention, you know, there's wide individual variation in how susceptible we are to the disease. Right. And then we're seeing, you know, some of the variants, maybe they certainly spread more easily. And yeah. maybe that's related to, to some of the details about how they're produced as well. And so, um, I have in general for indoor air issues, but I would say specifically for this one, let's do everything we can to treat the air, uh, worry less about measuring it. Uh -huh. And I would point out that the worst that happens is we have good indoor air quality and all the good things that come from it. So in a school, we see, you know, better uh, cognitive performance, reduced absenteeism, better performance on standardized tests, better learning. So, you know, there's reason to improve the indoor air. Let's do that before we start worrying about that. Right. And it's a win-win. I mean, you're not, there's, it's not going to do any harm to actually fix or improve the air quality. But if you don't, there's definitely consequences, for sure. Absolutely. For sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then, um, uh, I guess this is a related question. Are there benchmarks for indoor air and virus particulate matter? Do most schools have the ability to monitor those, those levels? So th there are, of course, with everything, there's benchmarks, but they're really different. You go to different places, you'll see different benchmarks and the whole issue of monitoring overlays that. Like part of the issue with indoor air, like we could take, if we had the ability, we don't, but if we had the ability to take a, like a perfect sample of you know my office that I'm in right now, we would find all kinds of things in the air. Uh, and some of those things we don't even know if they have any health effects at all, right? So indoor air is a chemical soup 
And so not only can we not really monitor that entire soup, but it's also the case that, um, you know, if we, to do that well would take so many resources, we're better off just cleaning. Right, right, makes sense. Um, and then, okay, this one is from Eric. Eric asks, my son's elementary school district has put in place MERV 13 filters on the HVAC, in-room CO2 monitors, and automatically increases ventilation when CO2 rises above 800 ppm. Now that CO2 target can't be lowered to 600 ppm, unfortunately. How does this, how does this system compare with the Harvard slash University of Colorado target of five to six air changes per hour? So that's the first part of the question. Okay, so um, it's really hard without knowing the details to do an equivalence, but I'll make two comments. The first one is I'm really happy to hear that that school is doing that. That's a really good first step. And then the second part of the comment is, you know, the details are always important. So an example is, you know, if you have a MERV 13 filter that it isn't installed well, there are gaps around it and the air is going around it rather than through it, mm -hmm. it matters much less that it's a MERV 13 filter. So, um, you know, I'm really happy to hear everything. And the follow-up is, I hope they're doing all those pieces well. Right. Uh, in terms of equivalence, you know, you can't do it because it, I need to know the airflow rates to be able to say that and the volume of the room to tell you how many air change equivalents there are. But I would say that hearing that, um, you know, they're a long way towards towards meeting or exceeding those goals, most likely. Okay. Uh, and then... Um... There's a second part to the question. Uh, the COO of the school district believes that monitoring the CO2 levels has advantages for detecting actual ventilation needs in a space. Um, and this person says they would like to donate and raise funds to deploy HEPA, HEPA air cleaners to ensure um, the five to six effective uh, air changes. Would that significantly increase safety if they did that with, with uh, HEPA filters? So uh, I am a big fan of putting HEPA filters in every classroom. And, and I'll say that because, um, you know, I know that they work. I know that they don't depend on that central system that maybe has to reduce the airflow because it gets really cold outside. Uh, or maybe there are distribution issues. So not every classroom gets the right amount of fresh air. Or maybe that filter uh, is at the end of its life and not performing very well. And so... HEPA filters, I like them. They're, they're simple. They're easy. Um, so I would say, you know, again, they might offer more benefit in some environments than in others. And it sounds like that environment is already pretty well managed. So maybe not that much marginal benefit. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the cost is really cheap. Uh, why not? Uh, I hope it doesn't fall to individual parents to be right. raising the money for that. I hope that this is, you know, I think there's a real equity issue as with many things in our society and in education. So I hope that we're doing this as a policy, uh, you know, board wide or, or, or province wide, um, but I'm a big fan of, of HEPA filters. Okay, okay, makes sense. Can I say one more thing about Absolutely. HEPA filters actually that's yeah. really important? Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, someone like me tends to think about the technical aspects of the measures. And the story I always tell is my daughter was back in school this winter before we went to virtual learning again. And one day she came home and knowing I'd be interested in this said, hey, we got a HEPA filter in our classroom. I was like, oh, that's fantastic. And then it was probably three or four days later, I asked her, hey, how's that HEPA filter doing? And she was like, oh yeah, we turned it off. It was too noisy. Uh, and so um, that's the other piece about HEPA filters is that, you know, they are noisy, especially if they're moving air. And so there's a really good opportunity for teacher, for staff education here about, you know, maybe the right solution is to get two filters and run them on a relatively low speed so they make less noise or to, you know, let the teacher and, and the others in the class know how they work. And so you know, if they've got their masks off and eating lunch, turn those things up to hot. Yes, they're noisy, uh, but, you know, you need the extra protection. And if the teacher is doing something that requires the students to listen, then, you know, turn them down and understand that maybe you're relying on the other measures more. And right. so be a lot more careful about masks and physical distancing when those type of filters are turned down. So with all of these kind of technical solutions, the communication and information part is really important too. 
Yeah, and, and from what you're saying, I mean, it seems like vigilance is a big thing, like as we return to school, as kids get back to class, um, exactly what, what you're saying in terms of, you know, if the HEPA filter is lower, make sure that your other measures are in place, all of that. And so it feels like there's going to have to be a lot more vigilance and a lot more awareness of your space and your surroundings in school. Um, and I do not envy kids going back to school in this um, in this environment, but I think kids, you know, we talk about this all the time, kids are resilient, it, it, they will adjust and hopefully um, it'll become another way of life. Like we've always talked about the new normal, right? And so hopefully it'll become a way of life and something that everybody gets used to within a classroom. Right, and remember, let's not just focus on the negative consequences yeah. and the costs. There's also the benefits too. Yeah. Those students, you know, think about, you know, when a student has to be absent because they're sick, think about, you know, the parents have to stay home. That causes all kinds of disruptions, especially for some families more than others. You know, other kids in the family are susceptible to getting that same respiratory virus via COVID-19 or otherwise. You know, you have all these kind of cascading issues. And so by, by expending the resources and paying the attention and paying the mental, you know, expending the mental bandwidth on this, we really do get benefits. Sure. And the whole challenge is we haven't really valued those benefits before. And so now I'm saying, let's value those benefits and it's worth it. Yes, there are challenges, but you know, we can overcome those challenges. Right, absolutely. Um, okay, we'll go back to the submitted questions here. Um, Okay, Ontario says that it has invested millions of dollars in remediating HVAC systems at schools. What does remediating HVAC systems actually mean and how does that improve the air quality within a school? Okay, so remediation means a lot of different things, but let's, let's take the most optimistic view. Remediating an HVAC system, remember that no one cares about HVAC systems. Two years ago, you know, I couldn't get parents to care at all about the HVAC system in their school. So there's a lot of HVAC systems that essentially have a lot of deferred maintenance. So remediation might be fixing some of those issues. Yeah. It might be fixing some kind of routine issues. Um, uh, an HVAC system is like lots of other systems. You know, you've got to maintain your car. You've got to do tune-ups on your car. You've got to get your furnace, you know, safety checked every year. That's the exact same. So some of it is just, you know, maybe we're calling it remediation, but it's just doing those basic upkeep things, making sure airflows are what they are, controls are working the way they are things kind of have a basic level of hygiene and cleanliness, you know, those types of things. Mm -hmm. And then in other cases, remediation means, well, you know, this system was designed for the school before we did, you know, three different additions to it. And, you know, we had to take out the boiler because of an asbestos issue. So we put in this different boiler and, you know, all these other things have happened over time. And maybe the system isn't performing the way it should, uh, or the way we'd like it to. So remediation might mean improving that. Right. The comment I would make is that HVAC systems are A, expensive, and B, uh, they're kind of integral to the building. In a school, you can't, you know, in the middle of a school day, go and remediate the HVAC system. It really, you know, requires shutting down the building. Often there are, depending on the age of the school, asbestos and other issues that have to be remediated. So, you know, I think that, you know, we might have this vision that, you know, all of our schools are gonna have gleaming, beautiful HVAC systems, and that's not right. Uh, you know, we should do as much as we can with the systems we have. We should certainly allocate resources to, to put in better systems. We'll get the benefits, as I've already talked about from that. Uh, and I think we also have to look at measures like portable filters that, you know, don't rely on the system. Right. Um, okay, and then another question here from Holly. Um, you just mentioned portable air filters actually. So Holly says, is a portable air filter machine per classroom going to provide protection for staff and students? Are these not designed for home use? Our classrooms have 25 people in them. Um, and as well, how often should those filters be cleaned? Uh, and if they're not, does that contribute to poorer air quality? Yeah, great questions. And, uh, you know, uh, the right answer is it depends, but let me give a better answer than that. Um, the short answer is, you know, there, I wouldn't necessarily advocate taking a, a, a unit that's designed for a small room, a uh, small bedroom and bring it into a classroom. You know, you have to do some sizing calculations to make sure it's sized appropriately. And then there's another issue, you know, 
things in schools get um, used quite heavily. So you want to make sure it's something relatively robust that can take the 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 uh, you know the the not the abuse but the the stresses that are put on it. Um, but but if you go through that sizing process. Um, and you know, I do this a lot of the time. There's lots of great online calculators. You can get to any air change equivalents you want. It's just a question of how many units you need in this space and how much noise you're willing to tolerate. I mean, that's really the central tension. And uh, um, but yeah, there's there's you can go through that process. So it doesn't really matter what the system is designed for. That kind of robustness issue aside. Uh, it's it's more how you size it, and potentially you might need to use multiple units for a big classroom. Right. Um, and and then on the question of when you should change the filters, um, it's a really good question, and I like it for for two reasons. First, you know, I'll answer it, uh, and that is change it when the manufacturer tells you to change it, uh, and that's going to be different for every unit because filters are designed to have different amounts of kind of holding capacity. Uh, for a material before they need to be changed. Also filters as they load up and get dirtier, they have a bigger pressure drop and in some units that means they move less air. So you're getting kind of diminished performance as you as it ages. So definitely do what the manufacturer says. But it's a really good question for a couple of reasons. One is that the economics of a portable filter, it's not the cost of the filter. I know you go to the store and you look at the price tag and some of them can be a few hundred dollars. And wow, that's really expensive. Uh, and you know that's true, but actually the real cost is in those replacement filters. Uh -huh. uh, and so I always tell people um, two things. One is when they're buying filters, buy some of the replacement filters. So when I talk to schools, I say buy a year's worth of replacement filters for all the filters you're buying. So at least you'll value the economics correctly uh, in, in seeing it. Uh, uh, and then the other comment is that, um, you know, it's it's um, really important to change those units. It's not so much uh, there is potential for odors and maybe a really small chance of some actual risk, but but a lot of it is mostly that you get really diminished performance. Right. And so, you know, it's part of that engagement piece and saying, oh, yeah, I've got this filter. I need to change it. Uh, and it's kind of one more thing for to kind of be on the list of the facility staff in that school. Right. So it's not necessarily contributing to poorer air quality so much as it's just not doing its job as well anymore. Correct. Yep. Yeah. OK. Um, OK, let's move on to some more questions here. Uh, more about portable air purifiers. Uh, school boards are also investing in putting portable air purifiers in classrooms. So how can parents know if this is effective? Is there a particular brand or feature they should be looking at for their kids classroom? Um, and are there any features which aren't as useful, like UV light ionizers, that kind of thing? Okay, so um, first of all, there is a lot of what I'm going to call unproven technologies. Mm -hmm. So these are things like ionization, um, UV light done in some forms. In some forms, it's very effective, but in portable units, uh, much less evidence of effectiveness. Plasma, photocatalytic oxidation hydroxyl radical air cleaners, all those things, you know, have not been proven. And I understand that the manufacturer will show you all kinds of, of test reports and so on. Let me just say you should have a lot of caution because a lot of times those don't actually apply to real buildings okay. and real, real, real uh, care. So, so it's really filtration is, is the, the, the approach here. That's not to say some of these other things might work or might, they might work in some instantiations, but there's two things. One is in a lot of cases, they've been shown to be not effective, even a little bit, uh, or in some cases, a little bit effective, but not very. Uh, so they don't work very well. And then the second part of things is, um, is that in some cases, they can generate byproducts as an operation of their uh, as they operate, just kind of how they operate, and those byproducts can be harmful. And because there's no real regulation yet of these devices, then, um, you know, I think that potential for harm is pretty small, but we also know that a lot of them don't work very well. Right. And so stick with what works. Right. And then how do we know, how do you know it's effective? Um, so uh, air cleaners, at least most reputable air cleaners, are sold with something called the clean air delivery rate. CADR. 
And that, that CADR is a measure of how much clean air the unit delivers. And so that's exactly when someone like me does a sizing calculation and says, okay, that's a pretty big unit. We can get away with one of them, or you know, we're gonna have two smaller units in this classroom. That's what we base our calculations on is that CADR. And so I would say, um, you know, ask the school board, what is the CADR of the units? And if you do a little bit of uh, Googling, you'll see some online calculators and other things that tell you how to go. You need to know that and you need to know the room volume and you can calculate how many uh, air changes are going through the, the device. And that lets you figure out how many air change equivalents uh, there are because of that device. And so, um, but, but, you know, to keep it as simple as possible, that CADR, that's the right measure. And you know, you're gonna hear from some manufacturers who don't like CADR. There are some legitimate criticisms. There are also a lot of devices that have very low CADRs that of course don't like CADR as a metric, but in general, that's what people like me use. Okay. And then uh, just going back to, you know, the different bells and whistles in a, in a particular uh, portable air filter, um, in your opinion, the bells and whistles are fine, but but basically you want to focus on the on the job that's actually supposed to do, which is the air filtration part of it. Absolutely, and and I would say further that you know be really careful about some of those because the you know the ionization or 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 some of those other technologies I mentioned can generate harmful stuff. I'm not saying it always does. It might be a little dependent on the air that's coming in. Uh, it might not be enough harmful stuff to cause issues. So I'm not. I don't think we should. You know you know, be scared of it. I'm just saying that, that stay away from it because I want something that's effective first. And I also want to be sure I'm not causing problems, even if it's a rare chance. Of problems. Right, right. Absolutely. And especially when it comes to something like schools, it's not just, you're not just talking about you and your family. It's a, it's a whole bunch of people in a smaller space. So you definitely want to avoid those issues. Um, okay. Uh, Okay, this is a good one. Since we've been talking so much about air quality, should we be focusing so much on air quality as an indicator of school safety? And what other factors should we be considering? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I'm someone who studies indoor air quality. So of course, I think indoor air quality is very important. But I would say that, um, you know, the way that we should probably look at it is, you know, what causes risk in to our kids mm -hmm. in schools? And I think it's gonna depend a lot on some specific circumstances, but we know that for example, um, you know, if the school falls down, that's uh, the air quality is much less important than the structural stability <laughs> of the school. And of course, schools don't fall down, but there are accidents that happen and that sort of thing. And so, you know, I think we have to situate air quality in, in amongst all the other risks we think about with our kids. And the comment I'll make is because we can't see the risk in indoor air and because, you know, there just isn't that much research and that much information, we tend to underweight that risk. Mm -hmm. But if you actually go through and do the calculations, for most Canadians, uh, not speaking not just to schools, but most Canadians in general, what we breathe inside of buildings is in fact, you know, our, one of our biggest, if not our biggest environmental health risk. Right. Uh, so it's much bigger, you know, we care a lot about drinking water, the quality of our drinking water, and, and we absolutely should, but it turns out we get exposed to a lot more in indoor air. Uh, we care about outdoor air on a day like today in Toronto where we've got you know the wildfire haze everyone notices outdoor air quality and how poor it is and absolutely we should care about that but I'm saying we should also care about indoor air so I don't think it's so much that you know I don't want to sound like you know indoor air is all all that matters because it's not but it should definitely be on the list of important things we care up, about up there for sure for sure um okay uh, let's take this one. Looking back at last year, there seems to be different perceptions of how safe schools were in terms of being places where COVID-19 can be transmitted. So on one hand, the medical officer of health and the government were saying that they were safe places, but then we saw community spread happen in schools. Um, and then on the other hand, there was the perception that, you know, schools have actually caused community spread. Um, what do you think, uh, what is your opinion in this case? Okay, so I want to make it clear, this is my opinion. I'm not an infectious disease expert. Uh, so my opinion is, you know, let's go to the evidence. And the evidence we have, we didn't do a good job collecting data in Ontario, at least data that's available to me. But there was a big study done in Georgia, for example, where they looked at schools that had mask mandates and schools that did. 
in schools that upgraded their ventilation in schools that didn't. And it's overwhelming evidence. They saw 40% fewer cases uh, in schools that either had a mask mandate or upgraded ventilation. Right. That went to about a 50% or so reduction in cases uh, when they upgraded both ventilation and filtration. And we don't have a lot of details about how much they did those things. Mm -hmm. But to me, that's the best clear evidence in schools that doing something makes a difference. So how important is overall community transmission? I'm going to punt on that question a little bit because it's not my area of expertise. Mm -hmm. But I, I would just say that like there's nothing magic about the boundary of a school. Right. There are there's there's, you know, even if, you know, kids are less important and there's kind of mixed evidence on that uh, in terms of transmission, there's a lot of adults. There's a lot of other uh, interactions between the community that happen in schools. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think there are there is reasonable debate there. But what there shouldn't be debate about at this point is we can do stuff to reduce the transmission in schools. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think you hit on a really important point there that there is no magical boundary when it comes to schools. And that's something that we've seen so much as we've been doing these Q and A's over the past year as well, people commenting saying, what is the difference? Why is school different from an office building different from you know, a retail store? Like how is that different? Because COVID-19 doesn't know that it's a school or it's an office building or it's a retail store. So that's been something that we've heard a lot of frustration from people. Uh, and I think and I think you're right, it's exactly that, that we can we can at least do what we can, right? Do the best that we can in terms of making schools safer. Um, and so, uh, Professor, when it comes to making schools safer, uh, in, in your ex expertise and in your experience that you've had over this past year, have you seen people sort of taking those big steps to make those big changes when it comes to, whether it's a school, whether it's even other indoor spaces, office buildings, things like that, has there been a sort of a shift in mindset when it comes to uh, air filtration, purification, that kind of thing within indoor settings? So yes, I think there has been a shift. And you know what I'm not sure about is, is this a permanent shift or is this just a shift as long as uh, you know, kind of COVID is in the news? Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, I really hope this is a permanent shift, not just because it's what I do for a living, but also because you know, I think that you know, there is so much benefit. Like I think about you know, respiratory disease. You know, when I lecture in the winter, there's classes of over 100 students. You know, and so when we're in the classroom, as we anticipate being this coming year, you know, there that's a lot of exposure. I have, you know, colds and, and you know, respiratory stuff, you know, several times in a typical yeah. winter. And maybe that's coming from my daughter at school. Maybe that's coming from, you know, the classroom. Maybe, you know, I touch my face too much. There's probably a whole lot of things that, that, that's causing that. But the point is, if we take these measures, you know, then we, we, we have these benefits beyond COVID. So I sure hope, I mean, there's been, I've had more conversations about ventilation and filtration in the past 18 months than in the, you know, 20 years of my career. But, but so there's clearly more interest, but I hope that that's sustained kind of meaningful interest. Right, absolutely. Um, and then we have a few minutes here, to, uh, Professor, if you don't mind, I'll just take these last two questions that we have. Sure. Um, okay. We often focus on measures inside the actual classroom, but what do we need to think about when it comes to gym class, recess, hallways, uh, and getting to or from school? Yeah, great. I love that question. I mean, that's so important, right? Is that, you know, again, we sometimes focus on the classrooms because they're obviously very important, but all these things happen. So um, I was giving a presentation last week and I showed like people very carefully measuring the distance between desks in a classroom and then the hallway, which was jam packed with students outside right. of that classroom, right? So yeah, we have to look at the, the kind of whole building perspective. And uh, so we have to think about, you know, certainly gym classes are a bigger risk because, um, you know, the, the, we're all inhaling and exhaling more or the kids are inhaling and exhaling more. So there's more potential for transmission. But there are also bigger spaces. And also, let's face it, physical activity is really important to physical health, mental health. So I'm not saying don't do gym class, but let's you know understand the risk. Let's do it outside as much as we can. When we're inside, let's make sure we're treating it as the higher risk space that it is. Uh -huh. um, corridors, bathrooms, stairwells, you know, in some cases, elevators, um, all places we have to think about, as well as offices. 
you know, don't forget that there's not just kids in a school, there's staff and, and, uh, uh, and there's others in some cases they can get exposed to things. And, um, you know, not to go kind of too deep here, but, you know, I think we also, I always take an occupational uh, perspective on a lot of these risks too. So we have people cleaning the buildings, which in some cases um, they can get exposed to, to higher concentrations of respiratory virus because of their, their activities or other pollutants as well. Uh, we have, you know, teachers, we have uh, school bus drivers, we have a lot of people who, who, who might have higher risk here. And so, you know, of course we care about kids and so on, but I don't think we should stop there. Right. Um, and, uh, oh, and then the other part of that question that's really nice and really worth addressing is, you know, how are kids getting to school, uh -huh. right? Th that's what I think about in terms of the own classroom, my own classroom that I'll be teaching in. You know, you might have students, you know, coming to the university from all kinds of public transportation, some of them on regional public transportation, that's maybe got a more limited schedule. So they're sitting in a coffee shop waiting for two hours for their for their go train or, you know, all these other issues. And so, again, you know, it comes down to two things. One is taking as big picture view as we can and reducing the risk wherever we can. And that's why this kind of multi-layered approach is so important. And two is, you know, there's this huge public education piece, you know, people like me, um, you know, I can talk forever about about the issues, but we need the people who are really good at risk communication, really good at giving people, you know, practical advice that will actually change behavior. Yeah. Um, and that's what I hope we see uh, going forward. And again, it's not just COVID, you know, we've got... Um, Unfortunately, you know, we might have a very serious flu season this coming year. We've got ordinary respiratory viruses, plus we've got all the other stuff in the indoor air. Right. And so, you know, it's nothing to be, I don't want anyone to be, you know, kind of paralyzed by it, but we certainly have to address it. Right. And I mean, I think fear is paralyzing. Fear is one of those things that, you know, you can't always move. You can't always make the decisions you need to make. So the idea is to, like you said, to to do the things that we know work, whether it's filtration, whether it's you know remediating the HVAC systems, all of that, um, to reduce that fear and to sort of try and make spaces, especially schools, feel safer, so that we can you know go about our business and hopefully uh, go into the new normal, so to speak. Right, and let's collect data about these things and how well they work too. That's right. I think another huge missed opportunity from last year. Is you know we did stuff sometimes, but we don't know if it worked other than kind of anecdotally. I mean, let's do it properly. Let's do these measures. Let's track incidents of respiratory virus and so on. It's not so hard to do. And you know the places in the world that do that kind of data tracking, I know it feels invasive, and I think it has to be done well and it has to be done you know fairly and transparently. But I think we learn a lot by doing that. And so we can, you know, have even better measures next year than we do this year. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a learning pro process. And I think the learning curve for this kind of thing is huge, given that we've never seen COVID before. And it's been with us now for a year. And that's all we know. Right? So right. definitely, yeah. like, as we learn more, we, we do better. Right. Um, OK. And then I'll take this last question. I know we're over time, but it's just the last one. Um, so thinking long term and knowing that many Toronto schools don't have modern ventilation systems or even windows that open properly, what should school boards and architects be considering when we think of pandemic proofing schools for the future? Yeah, so, um, you know, it, 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 I think it's fantastic that we're even thinking about pandemic proofing. And I think I kind of divide it into two sets of things. The first thing is, okay, we've got a situation on the ground. We've got to deal with it. So if that means, you know, some schools get more portable filters than other schools, that's just the way it has to be to address risk. Let's target the resources at the risk and let's keep those equity issues in mind. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, let's do those short-term things, you know, tuning up the HVAC system, getting portable filters, uh, making sure there's really good education and mask mandates, all those kinds of things that we can do right now, you know, and then, you know, longer term, I think we have as a society have to make a decision here. Clearly, I think this is something that's really worth investing in. And I think uh, hopefully I'll convince other people of that. But I think that if this is something that we believe is important, and I hope we do, then, you know, we have to start including this right now that HVAC system in the school is designed for comfort, 
and uh, maybe for energy use. Right. And, you know, those things are very important, but so is air quality. And so maybe, you know, that starts being coming part of design practice. And, you know, lots of people will tell you it already is part of design practice. And that is true to a certain extent, but it's certainly not, you know, kind of widespread. And right. so we have to kind of normalize that process of thinking about indoor air quality when we design these buildings. Right. And again, you know, just one last point that I think is so important is we always look at the cost when we do something like that. Right. And it's going to be a big number if we do it well. Uh, you know, uh, we're talking billions of dollars for the province of Ontario to really do schools, you know, renovate and make new schools, uh, maybe pandemic proof is a little strong, but make them healthier indoor right. environments. Right. But, you know, let's not just look at that cost. Let's look at the benefits, you know, and, and all those benefits I talked about, the, the learning, the, the health outcomes, the, the um, acute health stuff like, like asthma and respiratory disease, all that gets a lot better. So let's properly value it so that we make that investment. Absolutely. And on that note, Professor, thank you so much for joining us today and taking the time to answer all these questions for us. If we weren't able to get to any of your questions uh, this week, I do apologize. Maybe we'll have the professor back with us next next time, maybe closer to September uh, when, when schools are sort of opening up. Uh, but for now, we'll, we'll uh, call this a, a win and we'll, we'll close this out. Thank you so much, Professor, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.